Hey everybody, I'm Scott, and in this pandemic-themed show... No, I'm just kidding, it's not pandemic-themed. Talking about power strips again. whoop de doo um, In this case, I had purchased from the famous eBay, who's a guy I know, four of these Triplite uh, four receptacle power strips, or as they're called by Triplite, Diagnostic Surge Suppressor, Isobar Ultra. I don't know. Whatever, I'm not too familiar with their model range, but these are very old. Not like the oldest ones you can get, but on the older end of things. Um, used. This was used by facilities, if you can read upside down, which I'm assuming you can. And it was repaired by me. Because, like I said, I got four of these and two did not work. And these are the faulty two. I didn't really think I'd have much luck repairing it. I actually opened this one up. Well, first, let me describe what the problem was. No, let me show you what the problem was and is. Like I said, this one's fixed, so I'll plug this one in. Oh, jeez, there's a lot of wires here. Uh, plug it into another Triplite Isobar surge suppressor. And as you can see, if you were looking at this, this camera, yes, it turns on. And it's kind of hard to see in this lighting, but yeah, the switch is lit up and the protection present green LED is lit up and the line okay green LED is lit up yeah and the fault LED L, the, bleh, bleh, the fault LED is clearly not lit up as should be the case so let me get the rubber band off of this as I did not do that in preparation for the oh my god this is just turning out poorly for such a well that just split into a million pieces as one would expect this is going great and now I'll plug this one in, leaving it off. And take you back here. And voila. The, the uh, power light on the switch comes on. Very dimly, I might add. Dimmer than the other one. But I don't think that's related to the fault. I think it's just the uh, neon bulb in there is probably old. And the fault LED is lit. And the protection present and uh, whatever the other one said, line OK, are not lit. Hence the problem. Now, with these, unlike most power strips, or power bars, or ISO bars, whatever the fuck these are called. Anyway, unlike most of them, when these fail, when the protection fails, they stop working completely. Like, you get no output. Or at least in the manner that this one failed. I don't know if any time they fail for any reason that happens, but, uh, yeah, it's not just that the LED comes on. They stop uh, pr conducting power at all to these receptacles. So, enough talk, let me unplug these and start tearing into them. Well, not them. Actually, the one that's repaired, I'm obviously not going to tear into it. I've already done that. The one thing is, I don't know if the fault is going to be the same. I'm kind of assuming it is, because what I found very interesting... Now, I should note, these are very high-quality power strips. Um, I think they retail for like almost 100 bucks a piece, or at least they did when they were new. I got these four on eBay for about 50 bucks with shipping. So a very good deal. I thought all four were working. Not such a good deal if they're not, but these are fairly heavy gauge aluminum. I'm pretty sure they're aluminum. I don't think they're steel. The bottom plate might be steel. And uh, relatively heavy, very heavy duty, properly rated power cord for, for 15 amps. These are 14 gauge power cords, um, which is common on most power strips, but sometimes you get real cheap ones that don't. And uh, generally nice receptacles. Overall, it's uh, what do you call a quality unit. And obviously they have a bunch of protection built in. Um, I do not actually know offhand what type of protection exactly. Um, at least not for this model. Some of them list the protection on the actual front of the thing. This one does not. Uh, surge suppression is obviously is going to have that. Um, probably sp some kind of spike protection too. Uh, I think it filters noise as well. As I've been talking, I've been putting up on the screen what I just didn't say that it had. You know what I mean. So that, that's what it does. Not really important. Anyway, when I busted the other one open, my intention was not necessarily to repair it, because I figured probably one of the components had gone bad inside. Um, and short any replacements, I was just going to try to bypass the protection circuitry and just turn it into a normal power strip with a circuit breaker. Which is really all I need. I don't need these uh, necessarily to provide advanced protection of any sort. But it turned out the fault was pretty obvious and very easily fixed and indicative of a 
what I would call a design issue. And then there was another quite uh, surprising design issue that uh, I'll also show you when we dive into this one, presuming it has the same um, things going on. And if not, I'll show you what I found in the other one. So without further ado, Scooby, Scooby Dooby Doo. These are fairly easy to open. Um, I made the mistake when I opened the other one of taking this panel off and also popping out the circuit breaker because it just basically clips in from the back. Um, popping out that circuit breaker was difficult and as it turns out, completely unnecessary. And I'll show you why. So from this side, I'm only gonna take out the two bottom screws. The, the rationale here will become clear. I'm kind of doing this at a weird angle, so bear with me. Like, I think you'd all agree, like, this is not a normal way to use a screwdriver. So, uh, if I'm going a little slow and laboriously, you know, don't think I'm an idiot. Well, I am an idiot, but what the frig is my drill? You know what, I don't need a drill for this. Why am I being lame? I mean, I forgot in editing, I'm not doing this live, so I can just cut that out in editing. <laughs> uh, see what I did there? Okay, so all four screws are off of this side, and this just sort of separates. And if I go into a zoomed in a camera, you can see the, um, oh my god, not strain relief, uh, the retention thingy. Crap, my brain is, is spazzing on what that's called. Um, but anyway, that's holding the cable in place. Not real easy to take out, not necessary. You can just sort of fold it out of the way. And then the bottom, let's make sure I have this unplugged, you know, like always double check that. It is definitely unplugged. The bottom slides out, which is a little difficult at times, but there we go. Nice, uh, this, this is certainly steel but I'm pretty sure the rest of this is extruded aluminum. And there we see the innards of the power strip, or whatever you want to call it. Actually, you know what? I spoke too soon before. I am going to take this side off completely. I'm just not going to... That's, uh... What, oh, crap. That's what I was getting at before, right? Is that... When I did this previously, I popped the circuit breaker through. That's not necessary for this following reason. Which, when I did this in the first place, I only took the sides off first and didn't slide the bottom out, because honestly I didn't know that's how it opened. Although, in retrospect, it's fairly intuitive. Um, kind of have to figure that out the hard way. Anyway, so when this comes loose, you see it has a circuit breaker attached to it, but you can just pull these connectors off and then this panel can just you know go away temporarily and by the way it doesn't matter if you mix up these two wires it's there's no polarity here it's just live running through the circuit breaker but now you have uh, free access from the bottom and from both sides which is critical because if this remained in place you could theoretically get the board out and everything but you'd really have to like shimmy it out because You'll see next, I'm going to unscrew the receptacles. They're going to need to drop down. And if this little lip here was in the way, and the uh, circuit breaker itself, that would get... Well, that would just cause problems. You'd have to end up like tilting the board. Anyway, point is, should have just said to take this off in the first place. But when the bottom is on, the reason I didn't do that is because those leads barely reached the end of it. And I figured, if the, not knowing the bottom came off, I didn't know how I would reattach them when I put this back on. So anyway, it was all stupidity on my part. Well, not stupidity, just ignorance, I guess, because I just didn't know. Ah, this is critically important. Did you see this? I didn't actually see it fall out of this unit, but I can assure you it fell out of this unit because a very similar, yet white, not translucent piece of plastic material fell out of the other power strip that I repaired. And I will show you where that came from as soon as I unscrew these receptacles which actually unscrews the entire circuit board because the construction of this is very interesting. Um, by interesting, I mean I don't like it because it's harder to service and sort of mess around with. From like a DIY having fun standpoint. Oh, you know what I should do? 
Okay, now the board and the receptacles are free. See? The only thing that's like holding them in place right now is these connections to the switch. These three right here. They both, uh, they, all three of them go into the back of this uh, switch. And it's a lighted switch, that's why there's three connections. One of them is technically unnecessary for this thing to work. I'm going to try to show this to you while I do it. So, and these are very good connections. Very solid. I like it. And, yeah, three. Haha. This uh, wire came out completely. That's not a problem, though. That's the, um, that actually didn't have to come out, but it just makes it easier to maneuver the circuit board out. But this will connect to the circuit breaker. Thusly. So, anywho, now this uh, power cord is actually giving me trouble because it's like pulling on it. Okay. Now, this whole thing can't just simply lift out because. Oh, is this actually slightly different than the other one? Sorry, as I struggle with this. Oh, yeah, this one's slightly different and in a very annoying way. Okay. There we go. No, it's just um, this grounding loop is much bigger on this one than the other one, and so is catching on the case. And. That was catching on this side. Let me show you what's catching on the other side. That would be this green and blue wire there, as well as this lighter gauge. Sorry, I keep going out of shot. White and black wires. If I move this out of the way such that you can see, those four wires connect to this little circuit board here. And that circuit board is just for the LEDs on the front. It's just an indicator board. Um, I don't necessarily want to break this thing. Let me see. I think... Sorry, I keep... Damn, I keep going out of shot. I apologize. I think if you push it through the front like that, and then work this cover piece off, this cover piece that has the uh, writing on it and the little holes for the light to go through, that's the retention plate. And then this board drops out. I didn't actually take the board out on the other one because it was fairly uh, pointless. Now I do believe this board operates at 120 volts. The uh, full line voltage because oh there is a there are a couple of capacitors on here. Well a few. I don't think any of them are used as voltage drop capacitors for this board. I think it's just resistors in line with the LEDs. And there's actually a uh, fourth LED here. That's interesting. One that doesn't shine through the case. Okay, well... Man, I wasn't even going to do this, but now we kind of have to power this on on the bench just to see if that LED lights up. It's labeled D6. Which I'm guessing would mean diagnostic six. I don't really know. But, yeah. Um, do I want to power this up? And if so, how can I wire it without putting this half back together? Because it needs to go through the switch. It doesn't need to go through the switch, but it wants to go through the switch. I really just have to patch these two black wires together and that'll pass the line voltage right through and just it'll be bypassing the circuit breaker. Oh, I can use the circuit breaker to join these two. I'm an idiot. Wow. I was thinking about getting like a little jumper type situation, but no, we just stick the circuit breaker in there. And I just gotta be careful not to short anything out. This table is made of wood, so we're good there. I gotta keep myself and any metal parts well clear. I just wanna keep the LED board in shot so we can see if that green LED illuminates, which I doubt it will. Um, let me just prop it up on the back of my multimeter. There we go. All right. Um, hands are clear. No metal touching that thing. And I am plugging it in. 
Ah, that green LED over there did light. Interesting. So yeah, you can see this green LED on top, it's very dim, but you can see it flickering on camera. And it's actually fairly visible on camera. And then the red LED is of course the fault LED. And the way they're blinking, it looks like a uh, half wave rectified. Like I think there's just one diode per line source into this. Not 100% sure. So yeah, so even in the fault state, that LED lights up. I'm guessing that just indicates power. I'm gonna unplug this now. Uh, let's see. Resistors aren't warm yet. So I, I do believe the black and white wire are just live and neutral, as one would expect. I see no reason why they wouldn't be. In fact, the white wire is definitely tapped into neutral next to the neutral connection on these receptacles and the black wire is tapped onto this pad back here which is also where the main uh, line voltage comes in from the circuit breaker so yeah this is these two are just powering the board so whenever the circuit whenever the um, device is plugged in those will have power providing the circuit breaker hasn't tripped and the switch is on and then i'm guessing these two leads are fault indicator leads so let's see the led d6 goes down around there okay so the neutral is always connected to led d6 then otherwise it's connected to the through the fault in series with the fault LED. Should I go a big clive and take a picture of this and walk you through it? I will, but I'm gonna do it at a sequence. So after well, I gotta take a picture before I put it back together. Shit. Alright, let me take a quick picture of this. All right, well, I hope I got some adequate pictures there. Um, I'll show those at the end, I suppose. Okay, now let's get back to the board and where I think the fault may lie. Let me test my hypothesis. This one may well have a different fault. Well, that's disappointing because the other one was really easy to fix. And this is why I couch it as a design flaw, or a potential design flaw. These induction coils are very heavy, like very heavy gauge wire. They have a uh, ferric, ferrite core in the center here. So the problem was this, this is still a relatively heavy assembly regardless of what the core is there. And it's only held in by its two solder connections, one on one end and the other on the other side of the coil which is extremely hard to see I'll grant in fact you know I'm gonna pump up the uh, the gain a little bit on here that's better for sure that's definitely better um, so you see one leg is there one leg is there and you know in the back and those are the only two things holding this to the board there's no mechanical connection and you can see Maybe you can't, yeah, you can see right there, the tails on these that are sticking out from the board are very small, and there's very little solder actually holding these to the pads. Like, if you think about the surface area of solder that's actually touching that wire that's poking through the board, it's much smaller than I would expect a component like that to require or desire. And the problem with the other one was simply that this wiggled loose and broke both solder joints. And they were both sort of getting very intermittent, very shitty connection. And I re-soldered them and pushed the leads through just a tad bit more. Pushing the leads through brings me to my other criticism, or perhaps design flaw of this whole thing. I'll show you that right now. And far be it for me to criticize the trip light engineers. So this is the front of the board that sticks up that... You know the receptacles are in so this case is 
thusly over it, right? And the LEDs are about there because they need to poke through there-ish. You get me? So this board sits like this. Where did that piece of plastic go? The very important piece of plastic that I was using to make a point. Ah, here it is. So this piece of plastic, which feels like it's been exposed to heat and is very crispy now. It's actually, yeah, it's very brittle. Um, in fact, you can sort of see it just not disintegrating, but just shredding as I manipulate it. What this is supposed to be is adhesive lined, and it's supposed to be stuck on the back of this circuit board for a very, 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 very good reason, in that if this LED board were to drop down towards the main board without any kind of insulator there, you would just have short circuits all over the place. Keep in mind this is line voltage all over the back of this board in various spots you have live and neutral. And then on this board, various spots you have live and neutral. This is all live circuitry at mains voltage. So if this were to hit this, that would be quite a uh, zap. I mean, it should just trip the circuit breaker and, you know, it shouldn't really cause a problem. It's in a nice, you know, relatively thick metal housing. So it's not like it's going to cause a fire, I wouldn't assume. But uh, it would definitely mess up your power strip. And, you know, anytime you're shorting out electrical circuits, even if you have proper overcurrent protection, um, this could be faulty. You don't want to rely on that. You know, you want to design a product that doesn't run that risk. So the only thing preventing that on this product was this piece of adhesive tape that fell off so easily I didn't even notice it fell out when I pulled this thing out of the case. And it's not sticky at all anymore. And there's no adhesive residue left on either of these surfaces. So basically there was nothing really holding it in place. It was probably just floating around in here. And you say, okay, that's not a big deal, except for the fact that you saw these LEDs, as soon as I took off this retention clip, which is on the front of the device, which all I do is pull on it, these would have just fallen straight back. You know, or if I just subjected this to some trauma and like, you know, smack the front of it hard enough, this could go back and short out. I don't know. Um, not like the worst design. I mean, there's only so many ways you could cram all this circuitry into such a compact box. You know, I'm not saying they're, you know, idiots. I'm not criticizing them harshly. It's just uh, this material failed them. This uh, and this adhesive failed them. Uh, if I were to, not that, not that I'm some kind of like magical wizard of electronics design and safety, but if I were designing this, what I would have done is put a large piece of cardboard, something thick enough that the, you know, leads couldn't poke through it, over this entire area, and not relied on adhesive, and rather just had it large enough that it wouldn't be able to shift around and would just cover this entire surface. So that even if this board went down and came loose and started moving around the inside, it wouldn't be able to short circuit. And it seems like that would be a cheap way do of doing it. I mean, piece of uh, fairly heavy card, as opposed to this very flimsy piece of plastic. I guess it would be slightly more expensive, but whatever. Um, you might think that with all my big talk, I'm going to put a piece of card in there, but I don't really have any kind of um, water-resistant cardboard that I could put in there, because you also don't want to put something that'll get waterlogged in there. Um, not that this should be underwater at any point. However, if it were in a humid environment for a prolonged period of time, if you just use regular-ass cardboard in here, it could wick moisture out of the air, and then it could itself become conductive. But they have, um, perhaps cardboard is the wrong term, but I, you know the material I, I mean. Like, I've seen it in electronics, or, you know, even just a piece of plastic. I don't know why I'm going with cardboard. I think because it's an older device, and it would be like pre them throwing a sheet of plastic into it. But that's perhaps stupid. So yes, forget I said that. Let's just pretend I said a nice thick sheet of plastic. That, that would be ideal, I suppose. This is what I get for trying to criticize trip light. Your trip light makes great products, by the way. Um, I own a lot of them. So don't take my criticism of this one thing as me pooping on the entire company. Um, they make excellent products. So instead of 
following sort of my own advice there, I'm just going to cover the back of this board in four layers of electrical tape, which should be more than sufficient to prevent calamity. Um, how do I know it's enough? I mean, I don't know. I didn't do a scientific study to determine it, but I can rub my finger along this and every single uh, lead that's sticking through the back of this board just feels like a small bump, like a very smooth bump. And it does not, you know, it doesn't feel like it's going to come poking through this tape. And four layers of electrical tape is pretty good. Um, might this adhesive eventually fail? I mean, if electrical tape gets hot, it does tend, the adhesive tends to get gooey. So it could kind of slide off. What I could do is then also coat this side of the board with it. But you know what? If a little piece of plastic was good enough for trip light, it's good enough for me. Like I said, I'm fairly confident it won't cause a fire. It'll just pop the circuit breaker and uh, contain any sort of the fireworks inside. Anyway, I've, I've done this and I've put this tape on here, but that perhaps is premature if I can't find the fault and fix it because then this is not going to be doing much of anything. Oh. Wait a minute. What was that hole for? Okay. It's going to be very hard for you to see this on camera, sadly, because of like where it is, but I don't know if this is significant, but there's, there's a hole right in front of where my finger is. I'm trying to get the light to hit it in just such a way that you can see the shadow of it. See that hole right there? That's a soldered through hole that looks like it had something soldered through it. Like it's got the little, you know, little bump of solder that looks like a component was there, except there's no component there. So what is disconnected from there, though? Like there's no components with loose leads, are there? Oh, there are! Holy crap! Ha! It is basically the same problem. Oh, man. It's this uh, inductor, or choke, whatever you want to call it. Um, it was out of alignment. So it, from my perspective, being as this lead back here is kind of buried, you can see it's meeting the circuit board. Like from my perspective, it looked like it was going through a hole. I mean, I couldn't tell there wasn't unless I look at this very specific angle that I'm looking through right now, which if you look through it, it would be like this. And you can see, let me shine a light behind it. Oh my God, this is working poorly. Wow. Okay. There we go. You can see where that hole is. The, the lead for that component is supposed to be in that hole. The component is entirely shifted to the side. Or pivoted on the other, uh, yeah, on the other lead. Okay, so now I'm hoping to just kind of work that back into the hole from whence it came. There we go just stuck through. See right there? My big fat finger doesn't really isn't really precise, but right there, that's the lead that just came through the board. Now that probably means this solder joint is also going to be bad because the lead was pivoting on that joint basically to get in that position. So what it seems happened is that this this entire power strip suffered some kind of shock. Someone dropped it, threw it, maybe it was in shipping, maybe it was before the guy sold it to me. Who knows? But it was probably some kind of strong shock that just broke this component loose and uh, unmoored those two solder joints. So, well, unmoored the one and undoubtedly ruined the other. And there's another large uh, inductor or choke, but that one looks okay. I should take out the microscope and inspect these joints, but... So are these part of the circuit path, are they, right? I mean, they have to be, so... Yeah, so I guess that's why the um, receptacles weren't working. It's not necessarily that it cuts off power to the receptacles when there's a fault. It's just this fault happened to cut the continuity of the circuit. Now, see, the issue here is I also don't want to... Like, they have all their leads cropped very close. I don't want that protruding too far because then it might 
rub up against the back of this board. It doesn't look like it would quite hit, but just to err on the side of safety, I'm still leaving that a little bit shallower than I usually would. So now it's heating the soldering iron time. Always the most exciting time of day, heating the soldering iron time. I should have done that earlier. Okay, soldering iron says it's ready. Who am I to argue? So I'm going to be soldering that pad right there first. That's the uh, lead that completely broke loose. Um, I've got my trusty spool of solder here. This is lead solder or leaded solder. It's not just lead. Oh yeah. Then uh, dunk that in my steel wool, steel wool, brass wool. It's probably not even brass, but got it from China. So. It did not say what material it was, I did not ask. Now this joint is very thick as is the metal suit. I'm soldering it wrong right now. In other words, like I'm just putting a little bit of solder between the tip and the component and the board just to get better heat transfer. Um, never solder onto the iron except for that case. But I want to make sure I get the component nice and hot too because it's just basically heavy gauge wire so if you don't get it nice and hot now I'm gonna go from the other end and it is melting on the components and it's melting on the pad going a little overboard because I can't really see what I'm doing and this is a shitty angle that looks like it's okay yeah I definitely flowed way too much solder on there because the board's on an angle. I should have flattened the board out, but then the component probably would have fallen through. Um, so a lot of the solder dripped to the bottom of this pad. Once it cools down a little bit more so that I can maneuver it, I'll show you what I mean. Should be good now. How hot did this component get? Oh, yeah, see, the uh, inductor, the choke, whatever, uh, did not get very hot because it's a big thermal mass. So I'm not even 100% sure I got a good joint there. But anyway, you can see this light is a bit much. This is very glary. But you can see like there's a big bump right there. Like as I move it around, you can see the way the light's hitting it. That's uh, extra solder that just dripped down as it flowed. It won't cause a problem. It's just sitting there on the surface. Um, it's not like it's bridging to another um, trace or anything or another pad. So it's fine. It's just, you know, a little sloppy, but... Yeah, I cooled down way too fast. I mean, it's definitely going to have continuity, but did the component get hot enough? I'm going to say no, and I'm going to say too much of the solder drip down, and I'm going to lay this thing as flat as I possibly can, and just give this another shot. Oh, you do not want to lay flat, do you? Who needs helping hands when you got helping tools? I knocked over my, uh, oh crap. I knocked over my thing and it put little bits of solder everywhere. Okay. Now let me heat this pad back up. I'm going to first heat up the mess of solder I put all around it, and that should heat up the component nicely. Give it a little bit of time. Uh, soldering iron is at 600 degrees Fahrenheit. It's probably not... I probably could do with hotter on this, to be honest. Why, why would I say to be honest? Like, I would lie about that? And I'm kind of like overflowing it a little bit here, because this pad is huge. Alright. It's a hot mess, but I'm fairly certain that uh, that got the component because there's just so much solder um, on the, along the bottom of it that once that heated up, that had a little bit of contact with the component. Uh, don't look dry. Don't look dry. Come on. Oh, crap. Yeah, I think it's looking okay, actually. And you know what it is? Also, I put, like, such a crap load of solder on there that it's really, like, 
surrounding that lead very well and pretty high. So I think it'll get a better physical connection too. Well, anyway, so like I said, let me uh, do a similar thing to the other end of that component because that joint was definitely torqued around in a very unpleasant way. Now, now by the way, the board and the component are kind of laying on these pliers, so the component shouldn't drop down, which is a great idea that I did by accident. I mean, because I'm a genius. We come from this side. Just put a little solder just to get a little bit of a thermal bridge. Oh yeah, there we go. Now, like I said, leave this on for a good long time. Get that component lead nice and hot. Oh yeah, now it's melting on the lead itself. Ow, 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 it's spraying, fucks back at me. And that looks pretty good. Just a little dipple dabble. You know, when I was a kid, for like my entire life, up until maybe I was in my 20s, I used a, like probably most people did, a uh, sponge, a wet sponge. Never cleaned the tip all that well, like it would clean it, but it just, I guess once I went to the uh, brass wool or whatever kind of wool this happens to be, um, it's probably just aluminum coated in some crap, but anyway, uh, it just really cleans the tip nice. Anyway, and just tin the tip a little before I put it away. And behold the mess. This is where they dumped this out. That was dumb. And then this was the whole setup the whole time. Now, of course, the other obvious point of failure would be this other inductor. Is this an inductor or a choke? I mean, I know it's, it's the same thing. It's just how it's used. I'm guessing this is a choke, realistically speaking. These solder joints look fine, and this component is solid. I don't want to mess with it unnecessarily. Yeah, those look okay to me. I'm leaving that one as is. Alright, let's see if this works. I'm still hooked up, bypassing the switch with all the other components in place. Nothing appears to be shorting out. I think we're good. And I will now plug it in without hopefully moving it. When I move this lead. Don't explode, don't explode, don't explode. And plugged in. What happened? Oh, it is on. Okay. The LEDs are incredibly dim. I couldn't even see them. Um, there's no real way to shade the light in here. Uh, Let's see, these are pretty well insulated. You can see, you can see right in the, those little dots right in the middle of those LEDs, that's the uh, chip glowing. So the two green LEDs are lit, the red LED is not lit, and what about, god damn it, uh, this is unwise, the green LED on the back is not lit, because the green LED on the back was definitely in line with the fault LED for some reason. Still not clear, they're both just in the series. All right, let me unplug that. Well, that appears to be a successful repair. The one thing I will say about this repair and the potential for bad solder joints is that in a high current application like this, like if I were to actually load this up to its full rating of 15 amps, um, I would be a little worried if there's a bad solder joint in there, it's going to overheat, it's going to melt the solder and then probably cause a very intermittent rough connection, which is going to overheat, which is possibly going to melt a bunch of crap in here. I mean, this is fiber board, it's probably not going to melt the circuit board, but it might start melting the edges of the receptacles, could cause all sorts of nonsense to happen inside of here, um, and could ultimately, in theory, start a fire fairly unlikely given you know all the parameters but just something to think about when you're doing soldering on high current things anyway just my two cents looks okay to me though 
And that's not the reason, but one of the reasons why I labeled this one repaired, my initials and the date, is that I remember this is one I repaired, so that maybe I treat it a little more gently. Not that's like an electrically safe way to do it. I mean, you should just throw it out if you're not sure about it. But it's also that if it does fault out again, I'll know this is the one I messed with, and maybe I caused more of a problem than I solved. Um, I don't know. I always like marking stuff like that just so I remember what happened. And it's actually past midnight since I fixed that other one, so this one will have the next day's date on it, so I'll know this one was repaired on the subsequent day, so I'll know if it was the video subject um, circuit board that failed. Anywho, I'm going to put this back together. Uh, it goes back together exactly the same way you saw it, just in reverse. Instead of pulling shit out, I'm plugging shit in. Instead of unscrewing shit, I'm screwing shit in. So uh, I'll be right back. And 408 print... I now certify you repaired. Not professionally repaired, just repaired. And as you can see, the two green lights are lit, the fault light is out, the power light is lit. And uh, it wouldn't be a success story if I didn't plug something into it. And what better thing to plug into it than my soldering iron. Oh, this isn't all going to fit in the shot, is it? Okay. Yeehaw! Well, it supports whatever wattage this is. It's not on fire yet. So that's cool. I don't know why it would be warm, but whatever. Anyway. Success! So it was a very simple problem. I guess if you're up to it, if you have one of these that's faulty, or you've seen eBay auction for one with, which is claimed as faulty, and you can pick it up cheap, um, you know, go for it. Repair them if you can, because they're very good power strips, very good surge, blah, 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 protection uh, devices. And uh, overall, I recommend them, except for the perhaps iffy part of the design of having gigantic components held in by very tiny solder joints um, with very close cropped leads that don't leave much mechanical connection and that little uh, insulation issue i mean there is about like if you're looking at it in the end the big circuit board is like here and then the led circuit board is just here there was maybe a quarter of an inch of clearance between them which isn't bad it's like not a little but it's not a lot either um, and again, these LEDs could just be pushed down, like not, uh, yeah, like not, not just pushing on this plate, but like if one of these LEDs actually got pushed down or if this maybe got hit hard enough, they might come down, especially if this retention plate was a little messed up. Um, yeah, so that, that wasn't too, I'm not too keen on that, but, uh, yeah, if you have one that just stops working, just make sure no loose components inside. There are a lot of heavy ass components in here, so it might just be as simple as that. Um, yeah, otherwise you could change out a metal oxide varistor or a choke if you have, well, choke wouldn't really go bad, I mean, it's just a coil of wire, like how faulty could that be? But, uh, capacitor, any other components go bad, you know, they're relatively easy to replace. Uh, so yeah, thanks for watching, I hope this helped if you're also looking to repair one of these thingies.